Harrison and friends of Baylor. Well, we had an election this week, and whether your your candidate won or lost, it's really important to remember that we, as an institution, are here to improve health care and education in our community through science and discovery, and that doesn't change. Nothing about an election changes, and so we're here to do what we do, and everybody needs to focus on that, and we will all do what we have to do to, to better our communities. Now, uh, also very importantly, it was uh, Lily's brother, Louis's second birthday, just so you know. Big event last week. So, you know, we've talked a lot about viral infections. Oh, but as things have gotten better, partly with vaccinations and this people getting uh, over COVID or at least being resistant to COVID, now new bacterial infections or old bacterial infections are, are taking uh, front and center. So the WHO just announced that our old friend tuberculosis is now the global leading cause of, of death from infectious diseases. It used to be COVID, but as COVID fell, fell down, TB has come up. The problem is TB, before all of the COVID stuff, was, uh, was getting to be resistant to many of the antibiotics. And so we still have that problem. And so that's going to be a major problem going forward. But 8.2 million people were newly diagnosed in 2023 in the world, and there were about 1.25 million tuberculosis-related deaths. You know, this was this is a disease we called consumption because, you know, people would lose so much weight and it almost looked they were being consumed. And it's a you know this goes back hundreds of years, and we still have not really solved the problem of dealing with tuberculosis. So, it's now on the radar screen and something we'll be talking about um, uh, off and on. Also, big increase in mycoplasma pneumonia, pneumonia which is a, an organism, sort of a cousin of TB, but it's uh, not nearly as severe. But it happens in young uh, individuals. There's been a big spike in under the age of 1, 2 to 4, and 5 to 17. It's a really interesting disease. It usually occurs mostly in the spring and summer. There's been a surge, though, in this fall. And uh, part of the problem was, that, or part of the benefit to the COVID pandemic. Remember, flu disappeared, mycoplasma pneumonia disappeared because people were wearing masks and, and it spreads between uh, young people. And so it's often called an atypical pneumonia or walking pneumonia because there'll be a kid walking around who's coughing a lot, maybe occasionally has a fever, and you go to the doctor and the x-ray is much worse looking than you would think the symptoms. So it's an atypical pneumonia. People don't, are, are they're not quite is taken, uh, is, is infected, uh, it's not quite as bad as like a, a other bacteria pneumonia, uh, pneumonias. But uh, it is surging and it's in schools today. And so uh, there is a big, you should be really watching out if a kid is persistent coughing uh, and teenager and you don't seem to get better, probably take him to the doctor to get an x-ray because there's a lot of this pneumonia around and it is um, susceptible, it can be uh, cured by antibiotics. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting is pneumococcal pneumonia, which is the traditional pneumonia that is more severe in adults over the age of 65, is really getting to be more and more severe. And so the CDC has recommended that the age for routine uh, of pneumococcal vaccination be reduced from age 65 to 50. So uh, if you're over the age of 50, which is a lot more people, the CDC is now recommending that you get a pneumococcal uh, pneumonia vaccine. Um, it usually takes only one dose as an adult. I've had it because I'm over the age of 50. <laughs> well over the age of 50. Well, let's go to our friends at the Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute, TEFI, and look at what's going on in the world of viruses, because they're still all around. A couple of, it, we're seeing that fall surge that we expected. Uh, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, is going up. Uh, parainfluenza is going up. Uh, enterovirus is still there. That's uh, one that causes like an a, a upper respiratory infection. Uh, Mpox seems to finally be coming down. Uh, influenza A, I mentioned last week, is beginning to go up. And there's a surge in norovirus, which is a GI virus that is often on cruises. And our vice president for research, research is going on a cruise. And I pointed that out to her. We'll see if she comes back with sick or not. Uh, H5N1 is, uh, is still around quite a bit. 
the CDC keeps saying the risk is low, uh, but it's still uh, pretty prevalent. It's now up to 41 cases in, in humans. All of it seems to be a terminal infection. Otherwise, in other words, they get infected. It doesn't seem to spread between people. But it's up to 41 cases now. And this is the U.S. Agriculture Department just announced that there's the first case of H5N1 in Jackson County, Oregon. So there's a big flock of geese they've been checking, and they turned up positive. So, it, you know, increasingly, H5N1 is around in, in wild birds. We know it's in dairy cattle. Uh, the big problem was it showed up in, in a pig, you know, also in Oregon. So big, uh, big concern about that. I know people from Oregon call it Oregon. I like all three syllables, Oregon. The influenza season has started. I mentioned this last week. It's, can, it's beginning to spike up. So if you, have got, if you haven't gotten your influenza vaccine, please get it now because it is going to be spiking. It'll, it'll probably peak right at the January 1st area. And so uh, now's the time to get your influenza vaccine. Same thing for COVID. COVID is beginning to plateau or beginning to even increase a bit in, in wastewater. You see the emergency room cases are down, so that's not clinically manifest yet. Hospitalizations are down, but this is the concern. In wastewater, it has been falling regularly, <laughs> but it stopped falling. And what you can see, this is really interesting. This is all the sites in the United States that, that report uh, uh, COVID in wastewater. And it's blue because the levels are pretty low. But if you look at the percent change here on the left, so the red dots are, are high or increased percent change, almost 100% or more increase in, 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 uh, in, in the viral load that's there, you can see that the percent change in the last 15 days is beginning to see a lot more red. And where you can detect it anywhere, it's almost every single site. And so there's a lot of COVID around. It's beginning to increase. We're seeing that in wastewater, and you will begin to see an increase in cases. So please get your COVID vaccine. And if you recall, as I mentioned last week, the CDC is saying if you're over the age of 65, you'll need a second one. Nothing's really changed too much on the genetics of what's around. The variants are the same. KP3 and, of course, XCC is increasing. That's the one we talked about that's recombinant. Uh, in travelers coming to the United States, it's beginning to plateau again. It was falling, now it's plateauing, reflecting a lot more of what's going on in the United States with KP3 and XCC being the dominant ones. And there are just two interesting uh, articles I wanted to mention to you this week. One was uh, take, looking at long COVID. It's actually in U.S. Marines. So, you know, we all talk about elderly being infected. This was an interesting study because it looked at 900 healthy young U.S. Marines who either were asymptomatic or had mild <clears throat> COVID. And then there was a smaller group, but almost 25% who developed persistent symptoms. And if they had prolonged symptoms, uh, the most common symptom that they had was uh, loss of taste or smell, shortness of breath it was in 38%, loss of taste or smell was in 42%, and cough in 23%. And when they looked at how the Marines did in the year afterwards, they had a significant impairment. They definitely had less physical uh, abilities uh, for, than those who did not get infected. So again, if there's a good reason, long COVID is, uh, is generally prevented if you've been vaccinated. Here's another good reason to be vaccinated. And then one other interesting study looked at, can you detect parts of the virus still around uh, even later uh, after you've gotten over it? And this was a study that looked at the just tried to detect in 700 people uh, about 14 months after infection where they could find parts of the virus. And 21% were positive for still having, like, being able to detect parts of the virus around in the body, which is interesting. Not, not really sure what that means, whether the virus is somehow latent or just it's parts of it are being processed, but it's, it's really interesting. And those who have persistent symptoms, about half of them could detect viral antigens. So, Really interesting study. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but it suggests kind of that, that for those people who have long, longer-term symptoms, they're not able to clear the virus entirely. I'm, anyway, I want to end the day with a bunch of shout-outs. First of all, uh, congratulations to Dr. Mikhail Guzman Carlson, a fellow in the Department of Pathology, 
who is one of four recipients of the David C. Leach Award from the ACGMA, which is the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education. This award recognizes residents and fellows who foster innovation and improvements in their program, uh, advance humanism and increase efficiency and emphasis on the educational outcomes. So congratulations uh, to Dr. Carlson. Also, the 23rd annual BCM Charity Art Show is November 7th through the 22nd and features paintings, drawings, photography, and other works of art submitted by our Baylor community. There's a quilt on the show this year that was designed by Susan Hilsenbeck, a professor in the Breast Center, and was put together by Baylor students, faculty, and staff over the last year. You can view and bid on the art online. And a big shout out to all members of the Baylor community who are participating this week in the Walk to End Alzheimer's. Extra thanks to Dr. Josh Schulman, who's the director of our Center for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases, and Lisa Folador, uh, an administrator in molecular and human genetics who helped organize the Baylor team. And finally, Monday, uh, the November 11th, is Veterans Day, where we honor and thank uh, all of those who serve in the U.S. military. We have many veterans uh, at Baylor among our faculty, staff, and trainees whose military experience we feel provides tremendous value in their work. Baylor, Baylor has also had the privilege of caring for the veterans in the Michael DeBakey VA, one of the largest VAs in the country. That was our first medical school affiliation in 1947. We're very proud of that partnership. Uh, and we really uh, respect and uh, are happy that Baylor, the veterans are part of our community. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>